Now when you're ready to start. Okay, well, welcome. This is the Rapid Prototyping Lab, otherwise known as the Proto, Proto Lab, or a lot of times people just call it the 3D Printing Lab. Um, there's a lot, there's 3D printing here, but there's a lot more than 3D printing. Um, but we'll start with that because that's what everyone's obviously really interested in. Um, our printers started out all like this one right here that's working. It's a basic frame. The template is called a Prusa i3. These are what's called a, a rapid, um, the, 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 I'm not talking well today. This is what's called a, um, a rep wrap. It's a rapid reproducible um, printer and it can actually build its own parts once you build one. So once you build one, you can actually print plastic parts that will be used in the next one. All of this is open source. You can get the files online to laser cut the shape in wood or steel or aluminum or whatever and put it together exactly how their instructions and you can build a whole printer up that way. Uh, I, Prusa i3 is what Joseph Prusa, it's his third iteration of this. It's our main one here. And it's really simple. It's a fused filament deposition. You guys can crowd in a little more if you want. Might be kind of hard to see for everyone to see back there. You can set up a Peelys. So it's a fused filament deposition machine. 3D printing means a lot of things. This is what people more commonly mean, but there's other ways of doing this. There's ways um, of laying down a resin that is hardened and cured by a UV uh, beam that passes over it. There's uh, direct metal laser sintering, which takes powdered metal and shoots it with the laser to melt it and then reharden it in the shape it wants. Um, I'll go over those in a minute. This is the most basic form. It takes this plastic. This is ABS. You can also use, everyone see? You can also use uh, PLA, which is polylactic acetate, which is a, a corn sugar-based biodegradable plastic. It's very common. We work with nylon. We have clear filaments. We have other exotic filaments. But this is our go-to. It's natural ABS. It doesn't have any chemicals or dyes. And what this is, does, it comes down through this barrel here. I'll show you. Let's see a better way to show you this, actually. Let's see if I some. There we go. What we do, trying to find one that's built already, but they aren't. What's down here, what's in this housing here, is that's just a heat sink. So the filament passes through that and into, oh, do we have? We have no block. If you look, there's a metal block at the very end of that. That has a temperature center sensor and a heater in it, and it heats up to about 300 degrees C when you want it to. I think I have the max temp on this set at 280. And that's Celsius, so it's pretty hot. The whole idea is to get this down through there, and right when it gets to that part, melt it. It comes to the bed, sticks, and as soon as it comes out, it cools. You go all over, lay another layer in, on the same pattern, add another layer, add another layer. It's less 3D printing than it is 2D printing over and over and over again. Um, the, they, as you can imagine, they get pretty touchy with temperature. You have to set your extruder temperature just right for how fast you're going and the material you're using. Um, too cool and the layers won't stick together too hot and things will just kind of flow all over and won't stick right and you'll wind up with messy parts. Um, we use a special dip to uh, make it stick. It's a polymer uh, dissolved in alcohol so it works perfectly. Right now I'm printing a uh, bracket. If you look behind you, see if I can pull this up. This is what this looks like. That is parts for a bracket to hold a smartphone on your bicycle handlebars. And I'm putting that as part of a student project for a uh, electronics, uh, electrical engineering major. Um, we, that, what you're looking at there is called Repetier Host. It's our host software. All of these need host software to control them. What you do is you feed these a 3D file uh, that's known in a format called STL, a serial lithography file. Uh, and that is generally generated from your normal 3D mesh. STL is a mesh. It runs it, there's an embedded program in Repetier called Slicer that looks at it, decides, lets you set a bunch of parameters and settings, and it decides what tool movements and X, Y, and Z axis it needs to command to do that, and um, when to feed, when to extrude. So there's really only two, four, six, eight commands happening here. There's X, Y, Z, and Z is only one direction, so let's take one command out for that. 
and then extrude and retract. And it retracts because if you pull that out of the hot part, it stops flowing right away. Otherwise, it'll kind of drool a little bit and kind of hangs out. That one always, see it a little bit hanging out of the end of this delta right here? It likes to drool a lot. Sometimes I've come in and found a piece hanging that long off of it. So that's really all they are. Um, this one, this is a Prusa I-3. This was built by students here. Um, this is a Taz, I can't even remember the name of the model, uh, but it's, um, it's a Lulzbot Taz 4, that's what it is. And this, uh, a member of our club built uh, from a kit. The kit cost about $1,400, but it's a really, really nice printer. Um, here, pass that around. Make some really fun little prints. Yeah, we made a, he made a whole chest so, set off it. Right. Yeah. Um, here's cases for cell phones. Um, over time, I've played with them. I've, I've worked on turbines for hydro and uh, wind. Um, see some of my like prior iterations. Um, when it goes bad, though, it can go horribly bad. Here, pass these around. These are some of our errors. It's what happens when things get bumped or lock up or catch on something, where it's doing it layer by layer. So if it messes up, it messes up in a big way. So these are basically what you're used to, uh, uh, what we more normally use. The, the bed's heated to help things stick. The extruder's hot. So it's just those temperatures and setting those temperatures. And like I said, the movements and extrusion and retraction. These work on rectangular coordinates, something you're, we're, you're really used to from school, X, Y, and Z. This also works on rectangular coordinates, but the movement is polar. Um, I can't get it to do very much right now because I'm working with it. But um, let's see, that's that one. So I'm going to disable this, and just to show you how it moves, I'm just going to zero it out. So I actually think we can print. So let me show you how we print. This is a delta. Its movements, like I said, are in polar versus that. It has a slightly higher build space, but instead of having X, Y, and Z, it still has X, Y, and Z, but it computes the movements completely differently because each of these there's motors in the base that drive belts that pull these up. Whoops, I just messed that up. That pull those up and down. There we go. Um, and here, if I disable the motors, I'll be able to show you. Each of these motors here drives a belt, and that belt picks that up. And you can see how that works. Let me see if I can actually load something up. So this is Repetier Host. It's our hosting software that lets us run it. This is where we take, I'm going to home this quickly. Got a manual control. Here's our bed temperature. I set it at a preset. I set this at a preset. So that's all ready. I go into object placement and I pick it. Oh, I've already picked an object, so that's good. That's a 20 millimeter box. Just like I commonly use it for a test item. Um, then I go and I can change the size. I can change the orientation. I can duplicate it. I can mirror it. I can cut it off. I can copy it. All kinds of stuff. For now, I'm just going to use this. This is Slicer. This is an embedded program. With this configuration set of configuration scripts I'm going to pull up, has to, will let us, come on. It takes a long time to come up for some reason. There it is. So this is, these three headings control everything about how it turns that shape, that 3D thing, into a set of commands called G-code. And I can get in here and play with it, but right now I'm just doing a real basic one so I don't. But you see there's how it does layers of perimeters, there's infill, there's speed, there's the skirt around it, the support material, everything you can think of. You can also set the temperature from the printer for the printer here on a per print basis. Um, you save it individually, then you export it to a common file that I actually already have loaded right here. You see that's Max, which is this printer. Uh, no support, ABS, natural, 1.75 millimeter filament. So I'm going to go ahead and slice that. And what it did is very similar to uh, a compiler. It just took the shape and the inputs I gave it and said, okay, I'm generating this set of G code. And the G code looks like this. And it's very, very long. Very similar to what a CNC machine uses. But a slightly different flavor. But you see all that. Now since I'm going to check again, because this thing is really pesky. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and print it. Now it's going to start printing it. This probably isn't going to go well on having some problems with position on these motors. 
It also doesn't won't let me manually adjust Z height, but you get an idea how that one's printing. It prints a ring around it called the skirt, and then a wider area called the brim that helps it stick, so we peel that off when we're done. We always have to trim a little bit off of these. This also has a heated bed, but that's an AC bed. This is a DC bed. If I don't preheat that half an hour before I want to print, I sit, have to sit, wait, wait, wait. Um, these stops up here tell you when it's at the top and it does everything else. It's essentially robotics. And it's robotics printing something down that makes a shape. It's kind of a logical conclusion, you know, logical endpoint of this technology that things all start coming together and make this this simple. Um, they can be very large, they can be very small. Um, so these are that. Um, real quick, there's other uh, direct metal laser sintering. It has a build area and they rake some metallic powder across the layer. Then a laser comes and melts it. The bed drops a little bit. Another layer of powder is raked over just to a certain depth. The laser melts it. But it does the same thing as this, but you're depositing powdered material on and melting and fusing it at the same time. And then it drops and that repeats over and over. Another one is called a resin printer. And that's those are very fun. Um, basically, it makes a part with a liquid resin that hardens almost immediately from a UV lamp going back and forth. Sometimes they use lasers for it, but UV cure is real common. See, that's not coming out really well right now, but I'll show you, give you an idea to show you what it looks like and what some of the problems are. So let me quick give you a tour of the rest of the lab while this that's all cooking. So this is a full electronics lab. Oh, real quick, this is Big Red. This is our first one. Um, but right now we're moving the electronics down into this box, have been for quite a while. Um, and uh, it's the same design as that one that's printing over there. Exact same design. It was actually online before that one was. And you'll see it has a slightly smaller bed. Um, there's some minor differences, but it does pretty much the same thing. This is uh, someone's idea of a bad joke. Um, Someone from Wisconsin built this, uh, as you can tell. But we're always looking for people to get involved in the club because we want people to learn how to build these by taking and adopting these frames and building them out. We have parts to build about eight printers in here. So we just need you people to do it. Online, you, can, you can buy them in any stage of completion. You can buy them done. You can buy them as a kit with all the parts. You can source your own parts. You can buy them frame only, which I think... I think these were cut with a water jet over at Xerox because the guy who started this club worked at Xerox and now he works for 3D Systems, which is why we never see him anymore. Because, But yeah, you can buy, you, the design is free. You can go online and get the plans for this, get the actual, there's an STL for this too, but you feed it to the laser cutter or the water jet cutter yeah, yeah. and that makes, that cuts it the same way one of these prints something. And Jim, we have a laser cutter in the we do, but not capable of working with any of this material. It's very weak. Oh, okay. So these were pre-bought? Yeah, these were actually, a bunch of them were made by Xerox employees. That's how we wound up with them, because Mike Andrews brought them over here. Um, but they were cut on, uh, Xerox has a full shop, and they cut them on their water jet, which is really nice. What was the name of the frame that you A Prusa I-3. So real quick, this is real interesting. This is a circuit board router. Um, and you can actually make, we don't mess with this a lot. There was a guy who was very qualified to use it. He's the only one in the school who was qualified to use it because he did it for a living. He hasn't been around, so we, we have to get this going again. But it's very complex computer controlled routing. It produces, let's see what we got here. It produces printed circuit boards. Pass that around. Of any size. Size way too small to hand solder sometimes, I found out the hard way. I tried to print my Electronics 321 project on it, and uh, I did my pad for my uh, transistors way too small. There was no way I could hand solder that. No, I cannot. I cannot. But that is what this is for, because... If you start combining this technology, you come in with a design, say in LT Spice, if any of you have used that yet, you come in with a design in LT Spice, you lay it out as you want the board to be, you set all that up, you import it to this, you print the circuit board. One of these printers can be converted into what's called a pick and place machine. There's a little suction grapple on the end and it goes off, grabs a component, comes and puts it in a specific place. Very delicate work. 
but if you can get it working right and do it fast, all the components that go on this would go, it would just yeah. go like this and put them all on for you. Then you put it back in there and put this on, and this extrudes solder paste. Oh, nice. And it puts a little dot of solder paste everywhere you need. And then you put it in there, and that's a reflow oven, yeah. and it melts the whole thing down and solders it all at once. So we can fabricate electronics boards from not from a des pure design and into a finished product. Product. So that's that. These are rework uh, stations, and this is for taking one of these boards and removing the solder for it or reworking um, parts that got messed up. So it blasts hot air at it. It's got a heated blow. I don't know as much about these. These just came in, but it's basically for resoldering, repairing um, different uh, error spots on these boards. So we have a full uh, full set, and then this is our electronics test racks. We have two of them. They have an oscilloscope, a signal generator, a power supply, a DMM. So they're for anyone doing electronics projects. So if you haven't taken circuits or electronics and are going to, you'll be using these to do some of your labs. If you don't work on them upstairs, you can come down here and build things and test them. This is actually a prototype from uh, Xerox slash 3D systems. They use this to test different parts. It's very heavy. They have a counter on it. All, all it was for, there we go, this, bed's, this bed moves. But you get an idea, that's the same thing basically as that. It's got, it's got an X, a Y, and a Z. And a lot of times the Zs are lead screws like that. But you can... Print circuit boards as well? No, that's a 3D printer. Okay. Actually, it's not an actual operational printer. It was used to test printer components. Just how, how far, how, how many times something would happen before it wore out. So a student could take on that project and get it operational? That's a Theoretically, we're taking on that and, as, and thinking of making it into a very large printer, but Mike Andrews is also still working on. We have two printers in here. One's his personal one, Igor, and one's the Monster, which has a bed, the bed on it, about like that. Um, the bigger printers we have, the touchier they are to work with because of the weight and everything, but at the same time, and, and getting the heat just right on them, but at the same time, you can print some truly large things. Oh, John came in, you got the coffee pot. Close this up. Yeah, this is fun to use. I've used this a couple of times. It's really, there's so many. It's one of these things where there's 50 million steps, and at any step you screw up, you could break a $40 bit. There's, we have boxes of bits. One of them's $200. One of them, which is, they're both $200. One of them's a specialty set that there's half the number of bits in it for that price. So, and you wear them as you use them. And certain kinds of boards wear them worse. So it gets really expensive really fast, which is generally why we don't let people mess with it. But here's another one in partial state. This is kind of a junky one, but it's good for parts. And like I said, we have parts to build about eight printers in here. And we're always looking for people to take on projects. What was that machine called again? This is an LPKF. It's a, uh, a circuit board printer. PCB printer. You know, PCB being sort of printed circuit board. And as you can tell, tell our mo stepper motors make neat noises when they start running all together. Sounds like R2-D2 in here half the time. But the, the most difficult thing about any of this, and it's Lisa and I were working on possibly designing a lab or, or questions for you. Hard part is with this, yes, it works on basic physics, but it's all about computer control. And most of the problems you have with them are getting the firmware and the software and the G-code all working together. If something happens, it's not because some basic physical property you know, has gone haywire. It's usually because someone has a wrong setting somewhere and you have to just go through it and find settings that work. We're constantly calibrating these things. Um, I'm all, right now I'm fighting with that Delta trying to figure out um, it won't manually lower and raise Z all at once for some reason. So it, I can't adjust Z in software. So it has a Z offset that makes sure it's the right height off that bed so it doesn't completely smush the first few layers into it. And so it actually sticks it. There's a happy medium. I can't hit it with that. If you look at it now, it's probably pretty badly messed up. Yeah probably pretty badly messed up. It will print the box, but it's an ugly box. So is that uh, wheel bearings on the, on the drive and everything for that? Yeah, um, there's, 
we use bearings, these are linear bearings, yeah. and then inside we have a circular bearing and a, a, a knurled knob that, that grinds against it, that holds, that grabs the filament and forces it through. In this case, it forces it right here. The stepper motor is amplified, the power of the stepper motor is amplified by the gearing system. They have direct drive ones too, and that forces it down into there. And that's really what's happening. See that? It's clamped in. Let's see if I have one around here. Well, there's Jeff's. We can use that. His is, a, his is all put together. See that gearing in there? His is slightly different. Okay, well, that, that one's not mine. But what it does oh, is, man. what it does is these things. Oh, his is a little different. Oh, there we go. You open the jaws. Mm -hmm. And if you look straight in there, there's a hole going, boring yeah. straight through right. it. And all that does is this knurled knob, see that? Yeah, yes. In the all right, that pin. That drives it. Yep, yeah, it, it crimps it against yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what drives it just right there. It just forces it down through this. He's got a different kind of heat sink on his and a different head for that matter. There are a lot of different uh, aftermarket parts manufacturers for these. Uh, we generally use, um, they're called uh, E3D is the name of the company, and we use their version 4s everywhere. But Jeff's got a slightly different one. He has a new Rollsbot one on that. I have a different extruder on that altogether. Um, we're constantly trying different ones to see which one works better. Is there calibration in the program that tells you, you know, that the bearings and everything are moving at the same speed? or? Um, to an extent, um, it will give us an extrusion speed. Um, a lot of times you have to add multipliers. It, multipliers, it gives you um, estimated time that it'll take to print things, mm -hmm. and you're constantly having to adjust that based on reality. It's like, oh, it says it took five minutes, it's going to take five minutes, and it took seven and a half. Yeah. We have to put a multiplier in now, so it'll reflect that accurately. And we do that. But it keeps track of how thick your layers are versus what filament you have versus how fast you're extruding material. So it doesn't do it as different at different speeds generally, but you can set the speed of extrusion, the extrusion width, the layer height, all of that. This one has the same setup? Basically, if you look, I'm using the same program for both ones, both those screens. One of them is this running, yeah. and the one, on, the one on the right is this one, the one on the left is that one. If you see the one on the left there, you see in its imagery, it's showing you the layers it's freshly putting down in red. Right. And as they cool, it shows it changing color. So how do you know, like, if bearings or belts get worn out? Just visual inspection. No, it won't stop printing <clears throat> on an angle like that? No, that isn't because some, um, we don't know why this is. I think there may be a setting <laughs> um, that's off. Plus, I've had to tune and tighten down all these that were loose on here. Okay. And now it seems to be working better, but it does every single print. It starts out there and something hangs up in one of these it and it like pops over. Yeah. Uh oh. And it does that at the end every time we don't know, but it's finished. It's a half. And see, the problem is this one drools like crazy. It does this at the end, which I don't like at all um, because it just leaves it there. We had to go to glass beds, just had a polycarbonate bed on it. I melted a hole through it that way. <laughs> that was not fun. But, um, yeah, this was, like I said, this one has some issues we're working with. I want to get it going because I want to do a vertical axis wind turbine slash um, a micro hydro turbine out of this design. And this is something readily available online. But I want to start designing my own and doing single blades and putting them together. And this is perfect for it if we get it going. You know, we have one more printer. Eventually, we're going to have a farm of probably um, anywhere between four and six printers running. Is there things that Polar Printer can do that the XYZ one can't? Well, things with it added height, it's really nice for. Um, mostly, it's uh, really good for things that are spindly, I think. Um, you can do all sorts of stuff on it, it's a different style. Generally, not really. This, this, like I say, this has a taller build space. If you look at the way the build space is oriented on this one, they show the outlines of it versus this build space. Yeah, yeah. You're limited. So that's scaled down to about the same there. So that's the difference. So this, can, this one's at its maximum. I can print something that tall. I can't get that out of that. Or even that, I don't think. 
biomedical applications? Well, people are using these, being use these to print very low-cost prosthetics for children because children outgrow their prosthetics so quickly, and prosthetics are so expensive anyway. Like a lot of times, children run around with prosthetics that are painfully not fitting well, or their parent, their, their families can't afford it, or something like this. You can make articulated hands with these things, and the nice thing is, is you can design it in a computer so it can be sized perfectly for someone and then you just print it and it's that cheap, it's that simple, it's just made out of plastic. Oh, they grew a lot in the last two months? Print another one, yeah. scale it just a little bit. Um, you, they also can use them for other mechanical, other plastic medical devices. Um, it's really good for teaching things. One thing I'm excited about is, you know, everyone knows about CT scans and, and PET scans and everything, right? You can make those into 3D models. And if you can make it into a 3D model and you can export it in STL, you can print it. So imagine if you had a tumor somewhere and they could, they could image it five ways to Sunday. And they were going to remove it. And the surgeons really, you know, was in some touch area or near your heart or in your brain or something. And the surgeons really, you know, you'd, you'd rather they were able to practice it. But how do you practice on individual pathology? You print the whole thing in C2. And they get something, a model, to look at it and see how things are actually oriented in 3D space so they know how to go in. Is there a way of... 3D scanning in here so you can replicate Not in here yet, but you, there's all kinds of D. All you need is, I think, two camera phones and a turntable. <laughs> there's another version that uses layers, but it's, it's stereolithography, essentially. You just take a 3D picture of your object, and it'll turn it into a mesh, and you turn that into an STL and reproduce it. Cool. That was the original development of this in the, in the 80s. Yeah, they got uh, someone that does that at uh, Washington Square Mall, where they like, take pictures Yeah, actually my girlfriend works there, so she was telling me, she's like, I found this th place that does 3D printing, it's really cool. <laughs> I'm like, that's nice, as I'm trying to get mine to work. <laughs> you can buy really, they're nice ones there, you can buy off the shelf, you gotta play with them a little bit, but like this one you can buy like that, plain, without it being a kit. Matter of fact, I'm not sure they're, if they're making the kit for that anymore. Um, but we're like, it, we have, I mean, I have buckets of stepper motors. I could, I could probably, if hacked together, probably 10 printers right now out of the parts we have. So, did, I don't know if you already answered this already, but what's, as far as you're aware, what's the cheapest 3D printer that you could, you could buy the parts for, use plans online, and build yourself? You're looking at it. That's about $300. Actually, I think their kit is $300. If you source the parts yourself, you may get maybe cheaper. But there's a lot of trial and error. You will duplicate a lot of parts because you will find out what you like, what you don't, what works, what doesn't. So you will wind up with buckets, loads of extra parts laying around. But I mean, that's just part of the process. If you buy just a done kit, I think you can buy one of these from between three and $700. What about the roll of uh, ABS? That roll of ABS is about $100. That's a five kilogram roll. Five kilogram or five pound? I can't remember. They sell them in kilogram rolls and five pound rolls. Oh, great. Which is, you know, I think that is a five pound roll, yeah. So that's, that's, that'll last us a while. I put it on about a month ago. Oh. So. And we have all kinds of filament here. I should give you the exotic filament to pack, pack to pass around. So we have multiple kinds of filaments. Hey, where did, where did our exotic pack go? We have clear filament. I have an exotic pack that I don't know where it ran off. We'll have to see here. Well, I don't know where it went to, but this will give you an idea of just how many different, I mean, you can print with a lot of different colors. I don't like the PLA. My favorite thing is this plain ABS because everything else, you have to start playing with the speed and temperature to get it to print right. I went just between, um, we got, this is leftovers, or maybe we have a roll spool up there, it's leftovers, that I triple E bought us to do some of these uh, little statues for them. And we had to mess with it, mess with it, mess with it, mess with it. By the end of it, we couldn't print those statues out of it. It behaves completely differently just because of the addition of dye. So 
that could be someone's research project is how the thermo properties of the material changes when you introduce dye into the plastic. That would be a very good one. Most of the problems in 3D printing, like I said, have to do with controls and tuning, but a lot of it are materials issues. What is the melt point? What happens when you melt it and it re-solidifies? Um, how much does it shrink? Like the part is kept on a heated bed and the whole area is generally warm. When it's done printing and you take it to the cool, how much overall is it going to shrink? Because there is a little bit of shrinkage sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, a big problem we